let's get cracking. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm Chris Morrison. I'm Jane Secker. So we're the co-chairs of the Copyright and Online Learning Special Interest Group, which is um, a special interest group of the Association for Learning Technology, who are hosting us. And have been hosting us for 50 webinars 50 now. 50 webinars, yes. So this is amazing. We, we do have the webinar balloon. Can we actually unshare the slides for a moment so that we get it on the, on the video? Um, we so, can do that. Yeah, yeah. We just need to click that little square thing. Ah, oh, okay, fair enough. Just so, like that. This is this is for the benefit of everyone. We have 50 webinars since March 2020. Yep. Um, we are delighted to be uh, joining you again. We are, we are, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it feels like it, quite a milestone. It felt it, like it was worthy of the 2.99 I spent on this balloon. 2.99. Yes. Last of the big spenders. I am. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. Right. Back to the slides. Back to the slides. Uh, let's. Uh, go through what we've got today. We've got quite a packed one today. We it's, have, yes. Um, so yes. We've got quite and we a have few, a special guest as well. We do. So, so we've got quite a few um, items of copyright news, um, but we're delighted that Lisa Redman for the intellectual, from the Intellectual Property Office is joining us today to talk about the Intellectual Property Education Framework, as everyone knows, a subject dear to our hearts. Now the UK government um, has released this new framework um, so thanks, Lisa, for, for joining us. We'll give the formal introduction in a moment, uh, but we've got a really a great one today. So I think let's get let's crack, on crack on with yes. copyright news. Um, well, first of all, just a reminder, if you go to the next slide, of course, there are a few things before copyright news. Oh, there are. Don't jump ahead. <laughs> since we last uh, met. Since we last met, what's happening? So just We don't a, have a jingle for that. We yet. don't have, no, no. Oh, we could. We could. You could make a jingle. Yeah, another time. Yeah. There's a lot of jingle What have you been on. up to? You've, uh, you've been turning into that uh, Hugh uh, Bonneville car character in W1A, haven't you? Um, With your folding bike. Well, it's, it's not actually my folding bike. Um, I've, I, I've, it's a really exciting piece of news that I hired a folding bike when I went to Oxford last time. <laughs> and they are great. I, think, I would I like. I think one. my news is more exciting. You're, okay, go, let's go on to to your news. So yes. You you actually met the Queen, did you? <laughs> well, there was you know there was talk that she wasn't feeling up to you know she was tired and exhausted and mm. it was probably because I you know was chatting she to, to her. To she you. had to listen to me. I was chatting to her about copyright. No, this is obviously I'm sure you can work out. This is jubilee celebrations um, in Faversham where I live and the Queen was not there that mm. is a cardboard cut cut out of the Queen but it caused me much amusement and um, yes I had a very nice weekend of celebrations lovely okay so, well if anyone wants to suggest a caption um, or anything make any comment about either of those please feel free to do so and at the, the end chat. I might tell people the fun story of what I got up to on the Sunday when I was singing so okay yes lovely but right. we'll save that one okay uh, a folding bike, a folding queen. Yes, yes, <laughs> a very good. Um, okay, let's let's crack on with the copyright news then. Well, it's just first of all, of course, a reminder that we have an archive <laughs> of the blog uh, record uh, on our blog and also recordings on the YouTube channel. So you'll want me to, to pop those into the chat that. for yeah, us. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then um, while you do that, of course. Uh, uh, Maybe we can go on to copyright news now. <laughs> Let's do that. Okay. Uh, I'll pop the YouTube link in as well. We're, okay. we're seamless this morning, copyright aren't we? News, copyright 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 news. Ah, there we are. So what's the copyright news? So the first piece of copyright news is uh, the fact that Ice Pops. Ice Pops. It's still coming. Still coming. Yes. yes. Yeah, it's still happening. It's still happening. Um, we um, have actually kept the call for contributions open for mm. another week. We know um, that having it closed just straight after that long bank holiday weekend probably wasn't very sensible. So if you haven't 
put in um, a slot. We're particularly looking for people who might want to uh, join the World Cafe. Um, I'm just going to pop the link in um, to uh, where you can find out more all about Ice Pops. So it's going to be at this fantastic venue, um, the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. We have some great keynote speakers, one of whom's on the call, Emily we Hudson. Do. Hello, Emily. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. So yeah it's we're getting very excited but um, still time you've got till next um monday, monday next monday to put in a uh, a, a, a contribution con yeah. so we have got we've got lightning talks coming in um we've got quite a few of those but could probably squeeze in a few more we definitely as long as they're definitely quick. could <laughs> yes uh, nice. and world cafe sessions don't worry if you don't have a finished product it's just an idea for something come and share us your thoughts ideas prototypes, anything. Really. You get a table, basically. You get a table and you get to chat to people. So yeah. please. You could just give them cake, really. Do. Yeah, do. That's, that's probably what I'll do. So, so the next item of news is, oh, so this is so exciting. exciting. <laughs> um, so this is our latest podcast. It's the one that we've been getting very excited. We've been working on for quite some time. It's actually part one of a conversation with Mark Lewison, who is the leading expert on Beatles. He's a Beatles historian. He's uh, writing a trilogy of the, the the definitive trilogy of the Beatles history um, and Mark agreed to talk to us about the Beatles and copyright and actually there is quite a lot there there's loads there's loads there's some un, unheard footage as well of the Beatles well let's it it's really, really it's amazing yeah. we were super excited and yeah Mark's a really lovely guy and uh, we yeah I mean we talked for him to him for so long mm. that we've got a second episode that we hope to get out quite soon which is it, where we go into it's his even more library and archive it is the first one, it is because we is. actually got to visit Mark at his archive which is he the... doesn't say the phrase information literacy but he does talk about wow. how he does his research yeah and so I got very excited this, this probably isn't the last you'll, you'll have heard us going on about this the, the, but the first episode I, it, it's so cool it really he, he, is mark is just fantastic so yeah yeah so have a listen and, and in case it, you haven't guessed there is some new jingles associated with it people have to stay to the end all right I shall um uh, but also before we just go move on thank you again to chris jones from reading for once again helping with this amazing piece of artwork and uh, so i'm wearing chris's Sergeant Pepper t-shirt that he did for us uh, for my leaving do so thank you again Chris for your 50th for my 50th there we go uh, what, what, what is he gonna do for your 50th you better start creating it soon right we need to keep going okay let's get going okay okay right uh, next up we've got um, a webinar coming up that we thought we'd highlight um, being organized by IFLA um, it's called how to copyright in digitization projects um, I'll put the link into that one it's a free webinar um, and I think that just takes June the you... 9th that's yesterday isn't it oh it's happened yes apologies for that oh. so you yeah. might you, you, yeah. it's probably a bit late for that probably now. a bit late for that one okay, okay. all right well right. we'll try and get the recording of that one up. so we are uh, just to let you know that we I think we mentioned it before but playful learning conference is happening in July yeah um, in Leicester in on what are the dates it is the 7th to the 9th of July I yeah. think so we're doing keynotes talking about uh, it, yes um, it was you passed you. Um, uh, so we're, we're doing a keynote and we're really looking forward to sharing our copyright games um, there we absolutely are yes um, next up we've got a news story um, that we've um, we've heard about mainly actually via social media some of the Australian uh, copyright people from the library and archive world joined us at a webinar um, earlier on this year um, and um, there's been um, a, a kind of case going through the Australian Copyright Tribunal um, that was between uh, the Copyright Agency in um, or their equivalent of CLA and Universities Australia um, and the decisions actually um, found um, in favour of the Copyright Agency um, and the licence. So we're going to, we, we haven't actually managed to find a huge amount um, about this online, apart from this news item um, that's on the uh, uh, Copyright Agency website. Yeah, we haven't seen anything from Universities Australia, but we are in touch with um, Australian colleagues, I think even in this, this piece, which is from CA, um, they are saying there's more detail to be worked through, mm. uh, so there's more into it. I, my understanding of it is that uh, there is a requirement for Australian universities to pay um, 
the, the license fees. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. that's really the crux of it. Okay, yeah. next up, we have uh, a very interesting um, judgment. Emily sent us this earlier in the week. Chris, mm -hmm. do you want to tell us more about yeah, this? Yeah, so we mentioned this a while back. It's the uh, Cushley Dining Experience, um, which is was an unofficial um, uh, thing your mum went to, didn't she? She did. Uh, unofficial. My mum did go to a Cushley and, Dining uh, Experience, and yes. The, um, the case was saying it was copyright infringement, so the owners of copyright in Only Fools and Horses, um, and effectively the judgment says it was not fair dealing, mm. that it was an infringement of copyright. Uh, but uh, we expect to hear more of this once again. Plug for Ice Pops, Emily Hudson on the call today will be talking about parody, caricature and pastiche and the insights of what comes from that case, because as ever with these cases, there's a lot more in what the, the judge says about mm. the overall question. It's not just about whether it was fair dealing or not in this particular instance. It helps give some shape to what parody, caricature and pastiche means under UK law. And now the fact that we've moved away from the EU, um, it, it's, it's, it, it's actually vital. So as Emily says, first UK decision to consider pastiche and it does make reference to the Deckman case and other things. So we, th this is gonna be great. Mm. Um, mm, mm. So yeah, uh, uh, excellent. We will, I, I say great. Great from a copyright nerdy perspective yeah, to kind yeah, of get into yeah. the details. So we're looking yeah, forward absolutely. to hearing more from, from Emily on that. Yeah. Um, our next item um, is uh, really just to kind of report on some uh, work in progress that's going on over in the US. Mm -hmm. um, Will Cross um, is one of the contributors to what they're calling the Scholarly Communications Notebook. Um, Will joined us um, for a webinar again earlier this year where we were talking about OERs. Um, and um, they're basically going to be creating um, a, a sort of like an open textbook effectively all about open access and scholarly comms and there's a team that have got together to do this and they've just announced it so it sounds really exciting yeah. it sounds like something um be really interesting to see what might happen in the uk whether it might inspire some of our colleagues to think it might do yeah. it's going to be an open open resource so it's one of those ones that as with the the oer code of uh, best practice in fair use has the opportunity to adapt and build on what's already there yeah yeah, yeah. So that's great. And our final piece is uh, a reminder, there's not much time left on this, but this is Spark Europe's Open Education Resource Survey, the OER survey on European libraries and higher education, which we know many people on the call are part of. Uh, so if you still have the opportunity to look into this and respond on behalf of your institution, it's certainly very useful because Spark Europe are constantly keeping a track on the extent to which open education is being implemented, policies, practices, where responsibility lies, all of yeah. those things, which is... I think really I did useful. share this on List Copy Seek a while ago, but um, I know um, Vanessa at Spark Europe was really keen that we share this with our network and see if we can get some more responses um, from UK libraries about you know how they might be thinking about open education at the moment. Mm -hmm. So... I think that's it for the copyright news, that's isn't it? That's it for it? the news. Yeah. Um, so yeah. we are delighted now to introduce um, our guest speaker. Um, so we have Lisa Redman, um, who's the Senior Policy Advisor at the Intellectual Property Office. Um, so uh, we were involved in this. I'm a member of the Copyright Education um, Awareness Group, which is convened by the Intellectual Property Office. And one thing that that group has been working on for some time is, is how to get intellectual property into the curriculum or, or um, even if it's not in the curriculum, try to get a framework that allows it throughout the whole of education to be incorporated into the uh, various uh, subjects and, and disciplines. So um, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. Can we check, can you, uh, can we hear you? You wanna get, check that your mic's working? Yeah, I think so. Can you can you hear me? Ah, thank you, Lisa, and we can Excellent. see you as well. Yeah. So, um, Lisa, over to you. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jane. Uh, good morning. And we have made you a presenter. Hopefully, you can move through the slides okay now. I just did that a moment ago. So, but give us a shout if it, that's a problem. Okay, doke. Thanks, Jane. Thank you both, and good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, as Chris said, and as the slide says, my name is Lisa Redman, and I'm a senior policy advisor on the knowledge exchange and education policy team at the intellectual property office 
So I lead on developing and implementing the IPO's education policy, uh, which includes our flagship product, the IP education framework. Um, and I should say as well that I'm very pleased to be talking to you all on the 50th anniversary webinar. Um, so, yes, I'll be providing a, a brief introduction to the IP education framework, which was recently published by the IPO. Um, and I'll also talk a little bit about our plans and next steps. So there will be time for questions at the end, but I think Jane will also stop me during the presentation if there's a need to address something as we're going through. So a little bit about the Intellectual Property Office. Um, so the IPO is the official government body responsible for the administration and granting of IP rights in the UK. It is also responsible for developing the necessary legislative and policy frameworks around IP and for educating businesses and consumers about IP. Now, part of that education remit involves raising awareness of IP in schools, colleges and universities. And we have a suite of free teaching and learning resources that I will say a little bit more about in the next couple of slides. Um, but our education programmes and policy are constantly evolving from feedback from education sectors and other professional working groups, including across government. So at the IPO, um, we've been developing teaching and learning resources since the early 2000s. Our resources for primary and secondary education levels can be found on our Cracking Ideas site, which is now hosted on tes.com, the, the Times Education Supplement site. Our range of engaging curriculum linked resources explore different aspects of IP uh, for ages 4 to 16. At, prim at primary and secondary level. So the resources include teacher notes, lesson plans, PowerPoints and scenarios to help to bring IP to life. We also have a suite of resources for universities and for businesses on our IP support platform. So some of you may, have, may be aware of some of these resources. IP Tutor is an online learning tool for undergraduate students. It provides basic information for all the IP rights uh, and includes case studies to bring IP to life and quizzes to check understanding afterwards. Uh, and that training tool is actually tailored to four areas of study. So we've got law, business and accounting, STEM, humanities and creative or, or shape. Uh, IP Tutor Plus is a set of lecturer resources to help educators engage with university students on uh, on what IP and the associated IP rights are and why these are important to their, their lives, their study, their research and their future career. Uh, and finally, the, the other square on the, on the slide uh, refers to our IP for Research programme, which helps PhD students and researchers understand how IP fits into their research and the commercialisation process. You can access the IP education framework from our IP support platform. And in addition, we also have a range of short videos and case studies on our YouTube channel. So the IPO's approach to IP education has been shaped by the findings of a review of its education resources, which took place back in 2018. The education review, which was conducted by an external education consultancy, was commissioned to enable us to better understand the social and economic impact of our education resources. The results of the review revealed that educators in further and higher education institutions often use lesson plans and resources aimed at younger students to help them introduce IP concepts. However, teachers and educators at all levels said that case studies and real life examples were valued as ways to break down the complexity of the topic and to engage with students. So the IPO's education policy sets out a holistic, 
long-term approach to, to IP education, which goes from primary right up to higher education levels. And uh, a key product of our education policy is the IP education framework, which we launched in March this year. So the framework embodies the IPO's holistic approach as it shows how IP can be integrated into curricula at all levels and in subjects with strong links to IP and common to all education levels. And it also helps to improve access to our full suite of education resources by referencing and linking to them all in the framework. So the framework was developed in consultation with teachers from across the four UK nations and with input from industry and from professional bodies. The framework sets out the IP knowledge, skills and attitudes needed by young people from primary right up to higher education. And the IP knowledge needed by young people is expressed in the framework through age appropriate competency statements. And we develop the competency statements by drawing upon a range of, of sources, uh, including the, the review of our education resources. Um, we also drew on the national curricula of England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. We looked at the, the learning outcomes in our education resources and we referred to the Quality Assurance Agency for Higher Education subject benchmark statements. So in our research, we looked for different, for, sorry, for direct references to IP in curricula. Um, and we also looked for opportunities to introduce IP concepts around references to creativity, innovation and invention. So following feedback received from primary and secondary teachers during the development of the framework about the importance of teachers easily accessing the parts of most relevant to their teach of most relevance to their teaching, we developed versions of the framework for each UK nation at primary and secondary levels. There is a single UK version for further and higher education levels, but the premise of the framework to enable teachers and educators to easily access the parts of most relevance to their teaching is the same across all levels. And at FE and HE, we break down the competencies by age alone. We, we don't um, link into the curricula so much because it is so much broader. But in this way, and um, with uh, accessible supporting resources, teachers and educators are assisted to introduce IP concepts into everyday lessons. And we just have an example there of the, the various versions of the framework. So I'm going to talk you through the style and typical content of the IP education framework using the journey through art and design as an example. So this is an example of the framework at primary level key stage one. Um, so for this age group, we are suggesting that young people should understand that we use imagination to create, that naming work shows ownership, and that the everyday the everyday items around us have been designed and created by someone. We also introduce a slightly more explicit IP reference for this age group uh, by referencing logos and we talk about logos helping us to identify products. At key stage two, we suggest that young people should understand that creative work can be protected from copying and that there are names for different types of protection. So we start to introduce explicit references to copyright and trademarks at, at this age. Um, we suggest that young people uh, should understand that identifying who owns a piece of creative work is possible because we name our work. So again, reinforcing that key stage one concept of you know, the importance of naming work. And we introduce here the, the importance of seeking permission before copying someone else's work. At key stage three, art and design, we are suggesting 
that young people should know that there is a place for a conversation about IP when problem solving with creative design solutions. Um, we suggest that they should understand the purpose of the four main IP rights, although not in any technical detail at, at, at this stage. Um, we uh, introduce the idea that well-known artists and, des and designers' creative work may be protected by one or more of the main IP rights. And we also introduce the idea that you can take inspiration from others' work, but must seek permission before copying and also acknowledge the original creator. At Key Stage 4, um, we suggest that young people should understand that there is a place for a conversation about IP when developing design solutions to a design brief. And uh, that language is based on the language in the Key Stage 4 curriculum. We suggest that young people should understand the meaning of the broad term intellectual property rights. So evidence from the review of our, our resources suggested that very often teachers didn't necessarily understand the, the term intellectual property rights. Um, we also suggest that young people should understand which IP rights apply to their creative work and which rights are automatic and which rights need to be registered. And we also introduce the idea of the importance of applying for registered rights before exhibiting creative work or discussing creative work with investors. So at further education level, 16 to 18, we are suggesting that young people should know that there is a place for a conversation about IP when developing innovative design solutions. And again, that, that language is actually um, based on the A-level art and design curriculum. We suggest that young people should know um, about the different forms of IP rights, what they protect and how long protection lasts. So we're, we're expecting you know, an understanding of more technical detail at this stage. We suggest that young people um, should know what to do if they have to discuss or share their work before they have applied for registered rights. So for example, they might need a, a non-disclosure agreement. We introduce copyright exceptions um, and suggest that young people should understand that those exceptions exist uh, and, and that they allow limited use of others' work without permission. And we also introduce some other technical terms, so fair dealing, moral rights, um, and we also introduce um, licensing. So we, uh, through, through, the, through the sense that we suggest that young people understand that you can choose to share your work, but you can still set conditions legally through licensing. And at higher education, we are suggesting that young people understand that there is a place for a conversation about IP when generating, communicating and applying ideas. Um, and, and that language is based around language used in the QAA benchmark statement for art and design. We suggest that young people should know how to manage and use the IP generated in their creative work. Um, and, and the detail that will help them understand how to do that will, will be found in our supporting resources. And that is the same all, all the way through for all the age groups. We suggest that young people are aware that ownership of IP might be assigned according to the university or the employer's IP policy. Um, we suggest that young people understand the importance of establishing IP ownership when working collaboratively. And at this stage, we are suggesting that young people understand how to apply copyright exceptions and the principle of fair dealing to their own work. So not just knowing that they exist, but, but uh, having a better idea of how to apply them at this stage. And the same for um, uh, Creative Commons licensing. So that, that was a really quick run through of um, 
some of the content contained within the framework. So we are currently scoping plans to pilot the framework with schools across the UK. And we're hoping to be able to work with the four education authorities to recruit schools to participate in the pilot. Um, as I, I should stress that the, the current framework or the framework in its current form is very much a first iteration. Um, and although it was developed with, with teachers, we still need to, and to test how it works in the classroom um, with uh, primary and secondary schools and with teachers that, that represent all the subjects contained in the framework. And we need to understand how well the competency statements support the integration of, of IP concepts. Are there other concepts that should be in there? Um, and we need to understand how well the supporting resources enable the application of the competency, statement, uh, competency statements. So as well as piloting the framework, we are also looking to develop some new resources. So we've identified obvious gaps in science and computing, and we will be developing resources to meet those gaps, and which will also be framed around the competency statements in those subjects. However, we will also be looking at where we need to update our existing resources, especially in light of the feedback that we receive from the pilots. We are scoping out a train the trainer resource for further and higher education at a fundamental level. Um, and, and those resources will also include reference to the high level concepts contained in the IP education framework. So I've talked about the need for us to trial the framework with schools, but there is also a strong need to pilot the framework and to gain feedback from further and higher education institutions. And we will be looking at the best way to do that in due course. And that's it from me. Thank you for listening. I'm very happy. Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go back to our, our slides now. And I think we just have a couple of things to wrap up before um we let everybody go so yeah so as ever we will be having more so we've had 50 yes 50 50 webinars this is not the last oh, oh, webinar. oh. all right let's go to slide number 30. That's there the we go. One. There we go. um so the 51 next one is coming up soon on the first of july becoming a copyright specialist we have some people who will be joining us we have for some victims round two who've agreed it was a fantastic session, wasn't it? Last time we had yeah. Kate Vasily, we had Simon Cox, we had Hannah Pyman, now Hannah Crago. Yes. Um, but we have some more people telling us about their journeys to becoming uh, press ganged into we the still copyright need, community. We still need some more volunteers. We do though. actually. So if anybody there um, is interested, uh, please drop us a line. And we want people, you know, from it's not about it's about becoming a copyright specialist. It's not just for people who feel like they are one already. Mm. It's about, we definitely would like some people who are early on in that journey to talk about um, their their kind of, you know, how they're trying to learn about this. Yeah. So that would be great. Um, yeah, we're saying no webinar in August. No webinar in August. I'm sure like we're many people, summer break. people will be on holiday. So we thought we would skip that. Um, and we haven't yet agreed um, completely the date for our September uh, webinar yet in light of ice pops being yeah. on the 8th of September or so in fact what the topic, topic is. is going to be yes, any topics probably, that people would like probably be the week so. before ice pops won't it I think probably um, and we've also we're lining up um, we haven't yet fixed on a complete date yet but we're lining up um, a, a webinar about open textbooks and we've got um, speakers from UCL and University of Edinburgh to talk about the work they're doing on open textbooks so that's very exciting it is so is it one last thing time it is one last thing we're gonna play that song is we're it time play. for everyone to get those lights we're not I wasn't gonna play the one last thing song because as soon as I do that everyone leaves the session so <laughs> if you go to the next slide what I am going to do is share with you this is the sneak peek of the new thing we did especially for mark so you will hear this if you listen to the podcast but here's a sneak peek just to, to whet your interest let's see if we can get it to work
Nice, nice little face line at the end. Well done there, Chris. Ah, so thank you very much for having us again. Do you yeah. share the, the link to the, the podcast again just so that we can... Uh, oh, blimey. That's, mind that's right. I'm asking you to do too many things You are. You're time. asking me to do far too many uh, things at one time. Yeah. So, no, I can't do that easily. Okay, right. So. <laughs> Fair enough. Hang on. Uh, give me a that's moment. That's okay. I, keep, I can do it. Let's stop that recording as well now. <laughs>